and now present my judgment based on the evidence presented to me by the X-Ban Tribunal. In considering the case, I have deliberated heavily on the robust arguments provided by both sides. Impassioned statements have been received and reviewed from both claimants. But it is important to remember that while the jungle recognises the dubious prize the successful claimant is laying claim to, justice must be foremost in the mind of the court at all times. In considering the submissions, I make the following remarks. On the question of the age of the applicants, I find them comparable and therefore point advantage to neither. On the matter of familiarity with your local trader in items of phantom ephemera, and the proportion of your meagre available funds to acquire treasure, I find you both faced adversity through the tyranny of distance, the depleted funds of a teenager, or the absence of a complicit parent to drive you when the footy was on TV. The court finds equity in the efforts of the adolescent Master J to make regular treks to the Morab and Comic Quest empyrene of phantom lore and negotiate with Colin Williams. So too did the young Master Fraser similarly seek out to learn from an elder in his region of the deep woods in the form of Hendo. I note both applicants demonstrated exceptional initiative, drive and ingenuity to overcome such adversity, including creating their own artwork, cannibalising cherished comics to make displays and posters, and the use of unlicensed or alternative products to supplement your treasure collection. This was evidenced by the images provided, but it should be noted for the record Mr Fraser was marked down significantly for the dilution of the phantom theme amongst his bedroom adornments, which demonstrated an interest in sport in addition to our hero. Sport and the appreciation of same is not the natural habitat of the nerd and indicated a diversity of interest not common in the fanatic. However, the court recognises the phantom has a particular affinity within the Australian culture and cross-pollination with our national pastimes is inevitable, so this was discounted. In this respect, I found that there was some variation in the material displayed in the images, but despite this, the heart and commitment behind those displayed treasures was commensurate with the environment. On the matter of official recognition, I note that Mr J was a member of both fan clubs, and while only attaining the rank of junior non-commissioned officer, the effort to enlist in two different arms of the services, short of actually joining the Jungle Patrol, is equivalent to attaining the rank of subaltern in only one club. All discussions of the legitimacy of other of these clubs is best left to the ruminations of a separate tribunal. The physical evidence presented was considerable, albeit for the large part inadmissible for a number of reasons. These included, not of the appropriate era, too much bare skin, or submission to the judge while, by bashing on the door of his chambers during deliberation. All desperate tactics from both claimants, which left the courtroom filled with the unmistakable stench of de desperation and thwarted aspirations. Notwithstanding the weight of respect and gravitas to which the court recognises the endorsement of Mrs Fraser, her unsolicited testimony, made through a third party as it was, is hearsay, and must be excluded by the rules of evidence. The social aspects of both claimants' cases were brought to the attention of the court and aired, without reservation or any semblance of personal preservation from either claimant, and the court recognises the moral fortitude required to be that honest about your level of commitment. While Mr J successfully recruited a fellow fan, which outweighed the efforts of Mr Fraser, the court can be left in no doubt that Mr Fraser's attempts to woo women through dairy products must be applauded with the unabashed admiration of male fans everywhere. Sir, the court salutes your sacrifice, and the community thanks you for your service. Closing arguments were heard from both parties. Those received after closing were dismissed as overzealous, but no adverse assessment was made as a result. Special mention must be made to the efforts of the adolescent Master J, who in a breathtaking display of self-confidence and pomposity addressed in his personal chronicles us, his future readers, while penning his adventures. In true phantom spirit, the would-be heir to the phantom mantle chronicled his adventures, peppered though they were with references to puppy haircuts and household chores. The cathartic confessions of the dedicated fan who sacrificed his Saturday to repeated viewings of the one piece of external media to the film, the defining phantom event of that era. In an age before teaser trailers, the internet and spoiler alerts, he pored over every VHS paused frame, seeking clues and Easter eggs before they were even a nerd staple. The firm belief that his adventures, musing, and presumably his occasional forays with the Singh Brotherhood would one day be of interest to another living human is strong evidence of someone's meta-embracement of the world of the Phantom. The level of commitment required to mirror 21 generations of Phantom chronicling is almost enough to cancel out the sin of doing so in a John Sands Phantom diary, thereby surrendering its future speculative and exorbitant value on eBay. But in the end, the court must deal with the evidence presented and the facts submitted with due application of the rules of evidence. The scales of justice must be balanced, fair, and applied in the spirit of equity. 
I found the ardent supplications put forward by both parties were intense, but respectful to their opponent. The style and alacrity with which the supporting evidence was presented was entertaining and within the spirited competition of healthy debate. But I, along with the court, bore witness to the surprise evidence presented to the court, not revealed in the pre-hearing disclosure, of one candidate citing physical evidence published for the entire fandom community to see of a teenage fan so entrenched in phantom law, so dedicated in his collecting and devouring of adventures of a purple-clad hero, he not only noticed an error in continuity, not only took the time to verify his suspicion through research, not only thought anyone would care about what he had noticed, he risked personal discomfort, social isolation from his peers, and invested 25 cents for a stamp, and wrote to the publisher of the Phantom comic, the then owner of Free Publications, the late and truly missed gentleman Jim Shepard. He raised with the man himself an error in the message from the publisher, and who, as a teenager, read those? Moving, said publisher, to not only concede his oversight, but to present a reward for his boldness and daring. In the fine tradition of the phantom law being applied with judicial and balanced consideration for centuries throughout the jungle, this level of bravery, courage, conviction and attention to insignificant detail, in addition to the acknowledgement from one of the great and esteemed holders of phantom law, Mr Jim Shepherd, this court demonstrates no compunction in awarding the somewhat inauspicious title of leading adolescent mid-90s phantom fan for now and throughout perpetuity to Mr Dan Fraser Esquire. The court will now retire for an afternoon leaf through of the Golden Age special. Go forth and maintain the Phantom's peace.